when I started this, these courses back in 2013, there wasn't a lot of folks, right? Now you have so many people with courses, so many Instagrammers and TikTokers selling their stuff. It's sort of like, is this worth the time to like really invest in it when my heart really isn't in it, right? Like how can I maintain, you know, 400K in revenue a year? Is that the best use of our resources? I mean, the answer is not really. Hey, in this episode, I talked to my longtime friend, Matt Kepnes from Nomadic Matt. So Matt's got a travel blog that's wildly popular. He gets into that, shares all the numbers. He's probably one of the biggest newsletters that I've had on the show so far. What I love about it in particular is how thoughtful he is about his business model. Most people are just adding more courses and figuring out how to grow revenue and honestly, it's now fairly traditional ways and, and it's quite effective. But Matt takes another approach and he gets into in-person events and meetups and we get to talk about why in a busy, crowded online world, he's actually going offline. And I just think that that blue ocean strategy, as he references a popular book by the same title, I think it's interesting and it's something worth considering when some of the online strategies don't work. We also get into a bunch of other things like growing his, his uh, newsletter. Like I said, it's quite, quite large. And then also growing in an Instagram following. Instagram is not something that I'm going to actively pursue, but it's interesting hearing his approach of what he would do if he was at say 5,000 followers on Instagram and wanted to grow to 50,000 or more. So anyway, enjoy the episode. If you could do me a favor and go and one, subscribe on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you listen, if you aren't subscribed already. Uh, and then two, write a review. I check out all the reviews, really appreciate it. It helps in the rankings and I'm just looking to grow the show. So anyway, thanks for tuning in today and let's go talk to Matt. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nathan. I've been trying to get on this podcast for ages. Well, don't say that. That'll make people think that they can just get on just by asking. Really, you came to my house and stayed in my cottage on the farm. And then you're like, yo, have me on the podcast. And that's when I was like, absolutely. But if anyone just asked, that would not be a thing. No, I just mean I, I finally am like excited that I'm worthy enough in my blogging career to be. Oh, yes. Like I've made it. Yeah, it's only taken you like what a decade and a half, something like that. Thirteen and a half years, but you know, <laughs> slow and steady wins the race. That's right. I actually want to start talking about that side of it because so I've been in the blogging world for eleven years now. But even I feel like things changed so much in the those first couple of years, even before I entered into the world. So I'm I'm curious going back to the early days, what what were the prompts for you to come into and you know, come into the blogging world and say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to start publishing online. Yeah. You know, it was a uh, very haphazard. There was no grant and plan. Like I had a Zanga when people had Zangas, which is, you know, a personal blog way back in, you know, 2003, whatever. And so when I went on my trip around the world in 2006, I just kept updating this Zanga, you know, it was called Matt does the world. And it was just like, here I am friends, here I am. And then, you know, Everyone was really excited in the beginning. And then after a while, they got sick of my updates because, you know, they're back at their office job. And so I kind of just forgot about it until I came home in January 2008. And I, I needed money. So I started a temp job and I had a lot of free time. And I really just hated being back in, you know, the, the office with the, the walls and, you know, everything. And so yep. I was like, I need to earn money to keep traveling. And so I started the website really as with the goal of it being an online resume. You know, it was very bare bones. I used to share travel news, have an update, uh, like tips and stories from my trip. And then it, there was a section where like hire me and it had all my features and, you know, the guest blogs I did. I used to write for Matador Travel. So it just as a way to sort of build up a portfolio of oh, like, freelance hey, writing. Yeah, freelance writing. Because I wanted to write guidebooks. You know, I wanted to write for Lonely Planet. That was a dream, yeah. right? The guidebooks. And so just the blog was a way to hone my skills and just get you know, in front of editors. Be like, hey, look, I do write. You know, here's where I've been, you know, and, and sort of build that break base. And eventually that became a thing where I didn't need to freelance write. Was it called Nomadic Matt from the beginning? It was, yeah. I, I had two names. Nomadic Matt, and Matt does the world, right? Okay. 
because I like the double entendre of it, right? Even though, yep. but just because I have a weird sense of humor. And all my friends were like, you can't do that one. You get a dramatic <laughs> match. And it was really good because it's a much better brand name, you know, in the long run. But again, I wasn't thinking about that, right? I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm going to start this brand, you know, I get to think of this clever name that people can remember. It was like, I just need a place where people can see my work. Right. Okay. So now, 13 and a half years later, what's the, what's the, the blog and newsletter look like? And I, I want to dive into the business side of it because I think a lot of people build successful, you know, newsletters, audience-based businesses, but don't make the leap to like something bigger than themselves. And so I want to dive into all the, those aspects of it. 13 and a half years later, it's seven people. We just hired a new events coordinator to help my director of events, Erica, coordinate all these virtual and person events that we're going to kick off again. I have a te full-time tech guy, uh, a full-time director of content. We changed his title, but like three research assistants because you have, I, I picked a, a, a niche that like is always changing, right? Yeah. When you have a fitness website, how to do a pull-up is just, that's it. You rank for that keyword, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. Like how to do a pull-up doesn't change. What to do in Paris or the best hostels in Paris constantly changing, you know? So it takes three research assistants plus my content guy and me to basically keep up the content. And then I have a part-time graphic designer and a part-time social coordinator. Nice. And the, and how many subscribers do you have on the list now? We just called it. So it's uh 250 because we okay. just, because I haven't shaved it off in like five years or so. So yeah. we basically, everybody that, hasn't opened the email in one year where we're like you want to be on and like two percent of them clicked that button and we just got rid right. of the other 98 percent. it was like sixty thousand names yeah so for everyone uh listening 250 in this case means two hundred and fifty thousand. yeah two hundred fifty thousand. just to clarify a seven person business off of 250 subscribers would be remarkable it would, that would yes. be just as impressive but that's not what we're talking about here going into so a lot of people talk about or worry about, should I prune my list or that kind of thing? What were the things that went into that for you? That's a big decision to, to prune 60,000 people off a list. I think it was probably more maybe. I want to say yeah. 60 to 80, I, I, somewhere around there. We were pu pushing up against our, our count before I went to the next billing step. So that's always a good impetus to prune the list. But, you know, I, I've been thinking about it for a while because, you know, I, I really want to see what my true open rate is, right? You know, like, okay, I have all of these people and we were sending it this, I, I have multiple lists, but like the main weekly list was like 100,000, but it's been so long since we called and we have so many emails there. And I just really wanted to get a true sense of like, what's our active audience? And so between, between that and pushing up against the next tier, price tier, you know, it, yeah, it's cool to say like, oh, we have 300, you know, rather than 250, right? But who cares, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a vanity metric, right? Yeah, it sounds cool. I get a million emails, right? But if you only have a 10% open rate, like <laughs> you really only have 100,000, right? Right. So I think that the times that it matters is maybe when you're selling a book to a publisher, and that might be the only time <laughs> that you, yeah. like that dead weight on your email list actually helps you. Yeah. Like if you're, or you have a course, you know, or and you're trying to promote your numbers, but people probably lie about there you that go. stuff too. Yeah. So like, it, it really doesn't matter because all that matters is like, what's your true audience? Like who, who are your people that are really opening your stuff? Yeah. So let's dive into the, well, I guess really quick, I should say I am a hundred percent in the camp of like delete subscribers, like do that once a year, that kind of thing, clean up the list, go for the highest number of engaged subscribers rather than the highest number of subscribers. It's just a much right. better metric to track. And, and I think you would know better than me, but isn't this a good, um, like signal to Gmail and you know, when you, you don't have a lot of dead emails, just go into a blank account. It's never getting opened or you know, marked as spam or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Because a lot of these times, uh, there's a couple things that happen. One is emails get converted to spam traps. And so it's like, say someone signed up for your email list six years ago, 
and they haven't logged into that email account for a long time, Google and others will take it and convert it to a spam trap and say, oh, hey, this email hasn't been logged into in six years. And so anyone sending to it is probably not doing legit things. Now you're over here like, no, that person signed up for my list. But they're basically like, you should have cleaned them off your list years ago. And then if that person were to ever come back and log into that Gmail account, Gmail would be like, oh, just kidding. Here, have the, have the email account back. But they're basically using that. And so you can follow all the best practices as far as how people join your list. But if you're not cleaning it, then you will still end up getting these like spam hits and, and other things. So yeah. you absolutely clean your list. Let's talk the business side. On revenue, I don't know what you want to share on, on revenue and numbers, but I'd love to hear any numbers you're willing to share and then in the breakdown of where that comes from, whether it's membership, you know, courses, conferences, that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's like the pre-COVID world and the post-COVID world, right? Yes. Like, well, yes. <laughs> Because I work in travel. So like, you know, pre-COVID, we did over a million. And like, I was probably gearing up to like, in 2020, like one five. And so yep. we're going to get a little over one five. And, and again, you know, this is, I work in the budget travel side of things, right? So like, it's going to sell a lot of $10 eBooks <laughs> to get up to seven figures. Yeah. Dollar eBooks are 10 bucks. And so post-COVID, you know, during COVID, we, I think in... 2020 made like half a million and this year we'll probably get up to three quarters okay 800k it's coming back but, but yeah slow. yeah and i think next year we'll we'll get back over seven and then basically mm -hmm. like have to go from there you know so maybe 2023 i might get to that one five that i was going to get to in 2020 most of the revenue now comes from ads and then affiliates we did we did do a lot on courses but then i one of the things that you know a big pandemic that stops your business and allows you to do is really look at the things you're doing because everything's zero so it's like when we start back up is this worth investing time in and so right. the answer is no so we dropped down from i think peak of doing like four hundred thousand dollars a year in courses and this year we'll do maybe 40. And that's mostly because we just leave it up as like, you can buy this, we update it every six months. If it needs, it's basically like a how to blog course. Got all my numbers and tactics and strategies in there, but we don't offer any support for it, right? It's just, you're buying information. And so it's very passive in that sense, but it's not like a core business. But we're really moving, and we were doing this pre-COVID is moving into events and membership programs. So like we have Nomadic Map Plus, which gets you like all our guides, monthly calls, and it's sort of like a Patreon kind of thing. But yep. like what does that content, cost? Five to seventy-five bucks a month, depending on okay. what tier you want. So it's five twenty-five and seventy-five. Most people opt for the five, of course, and it's really geared to like get the five. But you know that brings now I think like three or four k a month, and then we have the events, which is donation based, but there's like another two k a month. And so this is like since COVID, right? So like that's say call it 50k a year of of revenue that we've added in that didn't exist before. And now I know you're you can compare that against the loss of the courses, but we had been phasing those out for years. And so that's really where we want to grow is bringing in more you know monthly revenue for that, right? You know, because once we start events, it's easy, and we're gonna start doing tours again. And, you know, so more high value things that don't take as much time. Right. So on the course side, I think a lot of people listening, maybe they have an email list of five, 10, 15,000 subscribers. And they're like, hey, the next thing is to launch a course. And they're hearing that's where a bunch of the revenue is. And so it's interesting you moving away from that. So let's dive in more. What, what made you look at the course side of your business and say, I don't want to like restart that in a post COVID world. Yeah. I, there's just, there's a lot of competition, right? So like, I think of it as like a blue ocean, red ocean strategy, you know, to think of that book of, you know, blue ocean yep. strategy, right? One of the reasons we went into events is because a lot of our traffic comes from Google. And so it's a constant battle of always trying to be one or, you know, in the first couple of spots, right? With every blogger in every company who, with SEO budget. But there's not a lot of people doing in-person events. 
or building sort of a community in the travel right. space. So I looked at that of being like, okay, there are a lot of people doing courses and they love doing courses and they're great teachers. You know, they're, you know, you get folks who, you know, like Pat Flynn, you know, Glow, like everyone, all these teachable folks, you know, they, they love that stuff. That's not where my heart really was. And so thinking of like, this is a red ocean now because you have, when I started this, these courses back in 2013, there wasn't a lot of folks, right? But now you have so many people with courses, so many Instagrammers and TikTokers selling their stuff. It's sort of like, is this worth the time to like really invest in it when my heart really isn't in it, right? Like, how can I maintain, you know, 400K in revenue a year? Right. What's it going to take? You know, is, is, is that the best use of our resources? And the answer is not really. You know, yeah. let other people do that who love it. I mean, you want to buy my information? It's it's solid stuff, right? Everyone loves the advice. But to really create like a cohort, like a class, which is sort of like the new version of courses, you know, like whether it's a month or three months, it's sort of like you go with this like cohort, right? My heart really wasn't into it because we can invest more in doing events and conferences and really in-person stuff, especially now that everyone's really excited to do stuff in person again with a lot less competition because it's easy, it's easy to start a course, but there's a lot of capital investment in doing events that we have the resources to do that you know, somebody with a 10,000 email list might not. I, I think I see a lot of people going into courses and particularly as you alluded to cohort based courses where they're doing it like, Hey, this is a whole class that you're doing. You know, you're doing the the fall semester or for the month of October or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, doing it, doing it the first time and really enjoying it. Cause it's a new challenge. They're showing up for their audience. It's just, it's super fun. All that doing it for the, for the second time and going, huh? Okay, that was way easier and way less fun. And then the third time and they go, I don't think I want to do this anymore. <laughs> like yeah. it, the money is good and I just don't enjoy showing up at a set time for a Zoom call or whatever else. So it's interesting of watching people jump on a bandwagon and then some people it, it works for really well and that is their strength and they love it. And then other people them going like, look, the money's good and this isn't this just isn't what I want to spend my time on. Yeah, you know, I've been doing it for, you know, seven, eight years now, and I just sort of lost the passion for, for it. You know, I think it's, I like when people take the information and they succeed with it, but I think after a while you start to realize, you know, it's sort of a 90-10 rule, right? You 90% of your students aren't really going to do anything with it, and it's not your fault. It's just because they become unmotivated or, you know, so... We tried to switch to the cohort base to be like, okay, this is a class, weekly fit, you know, weekly calls, like, get, you know, come on, come together, and you still get this drop off rate. That's you know, right. so it gets this heart, and you're like, all right, I've been doing this for eight years, you know, like moving on. But I mean, if you have the love for it, like Pat loves it, you know, like he's got a whole team about it. He's got all these cohort stuff that speaks to him. Where I think I'd rather do stuff in person. That's being right. Today. Well, let's talk about the in-person side because you did something that most people think is really cool and almost no one realizes how hard it is. I think I know how hard it is because I've a attempted the same thing. And that's starting a conference where everyone's like, you have this big online uh, following, like what you just need to, you know, so you have hundreds of thousands of people. You just need, I don't know, 500 or 1,000 of them to show up in a city. That's got to be easy, right? And so they go and start a conference. It's wildly difficult. It's and very so, difficult. <laughs> I'd love to hear what made you want to start the conference. And then, yeah, how's it, how's it gone so far? What made me want to start the conference was I really don't think there's a good conference in the travel space. You know, and there are good conferences in the travel space that are very niche and narrow. You know, like there's a Women in Travel Summit that's really great. There's one in Europe called Traverse, which I like, but that's like a couple hundred people. There wasn't like a, something to scale, right? Wits, which is Women in Travel, 
is like 300 people. There was, there's no thousand person, 2000 person, like mega travel conference for media that is done. Like, you know, the conferences we go to where it's like high level, you know, people coming outside of your immediate niche to talk about business skills. You know, there's, you know, it's always in the conferences. There are, there's always the same travel, like it's me and like these other big name travel bloggers over and over and over again. And I want to take what I've seen and, you know, from social media world to traffic and conversion, to mastermind talks, you know, to take all these things that I had gone to and be like, let's bring it together for travel. Let's create a high level, not a cheap, like hundred dollar event, like, you know, with major keynotes who get paid to speak because, you know, in a lot of travel conferences, you don't get paid to speak, right? So, you know, how are you going to get, you know, Cheryl Strayed to come to your event for free? Like, that's not waking up right. to do that, you know? I, you know, and while I can get nice deals for my friends, you still got to pay people, right, for their time. And, and so that allowed us to have a, a larger pool of people to create the event that I wanted to go to. Because we were also getting to the point where, why should somebody who's been blogging for five or six years go to travel blogging conference X when nobody is at a more advanced stage of blogging than you are? You know, nobody understands SEO better than you do, right? So, like, a w after a while, you're getting this just drop off of people being like, do I want to fly around the world to hang out with my friends? So I wanted to also create an event where that I could go to and learn something. Is that I knew that would attract some of the other OG travel bloggers. Yeah. So how the how the first one go? Like, wh what was uh, easier than you expected, and what was much harder than you? The first one went really well. Uh, we had six hundred and fifty people, and you know the next one we had eight hundred, and we're, now we're close because of COVID, but we're going to do one in twenty twenty two, and hopefully we get eight hundred again. Things that shock me: people buy tickets and don't show up. Right. Yeah. That's weird. Right. Because I was like, OK, we have 700. You know, I expected maybe like a 5 percent attrition rate, you know, so like I sold like 750 tickets. But then like 650, no, 600 showed up because the other 50 of their speakers. Right. I was like, wow, that's a, a lot of no shows for not a cheap conference, you know. And so right. we plan, you know, a 10 percent attrition rate now. And you just mean someone who doesn't even pick up their badge, not even they didn't come to, you know, Cheryl Strait's keynote, but just like they didn't show up to anything at the conference. Yeah, they just did not show up to the conference at all, you know. And so like, that was a shock to me. I mean, I know I work in travel and, you know, people get last minute press trips or they, you know, they buy their ticket and they can't come because they're they got stuck in you know, the Seychelles or whatever. But I did not expect such a high level of no shows. Because the food, here's another thing. Food costs a lot of money, <laughs> yes. right? You know, I, I fully understand why the airlines took one olive out of your salad, right? Because, yeah, it's one olive. But times by a million people every day, it's actually adds up, right? So, like, right. you think, oh, well, a drink's five bucks. That's cool. We'll do a happy hour. Okay, now times that by a thousand drinks, right? You know, times two. Because everyone's drinking two or three, you know, at least two, right? So then you're like, yeah. okay, that's a fifteen thousand dollar bill that you end up with, you know, when everyone's all said and done with tax and tip. Hotel, it's crazy. It's like, okay, these fees. You're like, oh, I gotta spend this. So like, yeah, okay, here is your lunch bill, fifty grand. But then there's this fee, that fee, this fee, this fee, and you're like, JK, it's like sixty five. And you're like, all right, I guess I got a budget for that too. So. That was that was really weird. You know, like, how does a lunch cost forty thousand dollars? You know, and actually, hotels overcharge and they add a bunch of fees. And yeah, you can get there pretty quick. So if you were like, if I, if I was starting a conference today, say I have fifty thousand people on an email list or hundred thousand, and I'm like, Matt, I heard you started a conference. I'm going to do it too. What advice do you have for me? Like, what are the first things that you'd call out? It's going to cost like three times more than you think. Pricing, like where I went wrong in the second year, right? So like we've lost money the first two years doing it, but I expected to lose money. It wasn't because I was investing in this long-term thing, right? But where, 
where I lost more money on the second year is that I didn't really factor in flights as well as I did. Like I kind of lowballed it. And I, so I always think you should. Oh, and I also invited, I kept inviting people without really seeing like, where was I on my like speaker feed thing. So like really oh, yeah. creating a budget and then sticking to it. And even if that means not getting some of your dream folks until a later year, but working up the food and beverage costs first. Because, you know, you go to the hotel and they're going to say your F&B, you know, is $90,000. And you think, I'm never going to hit that. No, you're going to go way, you're going to blow past that. Because you got to get them to say, what are all the fees? You know, like, okay, you know, if I have a 300 person conference and I want to do two lunches, what does that look like? Plus all the taxes and the fees. Oh, okay, because they'll quote you the lunch price, and you'll yeah. you'll pencil that into your spreadsheet, and they'll fail to mention that there's mandatory gratuity on top of that, and taxes, and whatever else. Yeah, whatever you know, plate fee there is, right? So you got to factor all that in, and then look at what you got left. It's like when you're buying a car, and you have to talk in terms of the out the door price, in terms yeah. of whatever the sticker price. <laughs> yeah, I made that mistake when I bought my car last year. I was like, oh, it's seventeen. I was like, wait. How did 17 go from 17,000 to 22? And like, well, this right. thing, that, I was like, ah, okay. Yeah. Do you think, like, what are some of the opportunities that have come out from running the conference? And has it had the effects of your community that you hoped it would? You know, this is a very blogger faced event, you know, more than just travel consumers. But it's definitely allowed me to, you know, meet folks like Cheryl Strayed. You know, a great way to meet your heroes is to pay them to come speak at a conference. Yes. So, you know, I, I know Cheryl, like that's cool. The becoming more ingrained in sort of the, the PR side and with the DMOs and the brands, because, you know, on What's the website, a DMO? A destination marketing organization. Okay. So they're like, you know, visit, you know, Boise, you know, visit Idaho. Yeah. We call them a DMO. And so like, since I don't really do press trips, on the, the website, I don't know a lot of them really well. And so this has been a way to sort of become more ingrained on that sort of industry side of events and not live in my own. And that's helpful because now I know all these folks when we want to have meetups that might be sponsored. When I do a consumer event, which is, is next up. So get these folks to come for that. So it's just really been good just professionally to meet a lot of people that I would normally just not meet simply because I go to events and they're like, Hey, come to our destination. We'll give you a free trip. I'm like, we have a policy. So I, I don't get invited to as many things as you would think. Yeah. Why, why do you have that policy? What do you, like what's behind it? And why is that different from other travel bloggers? Uh, it mostly stems from my hatred of reciprocity. The, the, you know, like if you, if I go on a free trip and it sucked, like, I, then it creates it's awkward if I have to go like uh, like hey you suck and I have to write this online right then yeah. it creates a lot of bad blood that gets talked about you know it's you know very small industry people move around a lot so you, you get less opportunities or I can just go hey I'm not going to write that and then I feel bad because like you know like you're a nice person you're just doing their job you know like it's not your fault I had a bad time right you know I, I did this once with a friend. And she gave me a couple of places to stay at a hotel in San Jose, Costa Rica. And she this hotel was really far out of town. And the, the amount it took me to take a taxi back and forth, like I could have just got a place right in the center of San Jose. You know? right. And so I was like, I, I really just, I just don't think it's a good fit for my audience. And she was very unhappy about it. I was like, I mean, I could write it, in, but I have to say that. But you're not going to like it. And yeah. yeah. And so I just never wanted to put myself in those situations again. And I also think that taking a lot of free travel, like I do budget travel. So you giving me a resort, like that doesn't, how does that help my audience? So if I start living this awesome life and getting free stuff, that's great for me, but it's not good for my audience. And so I don't mind taking free tours. If like, let's say I'm going to go to Scotland, right? I did this actually, this is a real life example. I wanted access because I wanted to write about 
scotch. So I was like, hey, I don't want to do like the public tour, you know, that 20 bucks, you, you know, it's like 10 minutes and you get the, I like, I want to talk to people because I want quotes for articles. I'm going to do like history stuff. So I contacted the Scottish Tourism Board and they got, got me to visit Ally. That's where I went to. I just love to eat scotch. And so they got me like private tours so I could like take notes and such. And they gave me a free accommodation. But I was like, I want to be really clear about this. I'm not mentioning this as place. And they're like, just, just take it. And so, and I didn't mention it. And I did mention that, you know, I got access to these, you know, distillers to ask some questions, but it was more about building this article as a journalist than, hey, I want like free tours. You know, like, I mean, it's, a, I saved 20 bucks, right? But the point was, I, I, I wanted to learn about the process to write about this story. But even then, they offered me free flights and stuff. I was like, oh, no, I just, I just want the tours, please. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting of the what a lot of people would view as the perks to get into travel blogging, right? I want to get into it because then I have these free trips or uh, I can have these write-offs or whatever else. I think it's the write-offs you get no matter what. But, yeah. you know, that that's the other side of like uh, everything comes with a cost. And I, I think it's important to realize what you're doing because you want to versus – what you're doing because now you feel obligated because someone gave you something for free. Yeah. The most things I tend to accept are city tourism cards, which gets you like free access to museums and stuff. It's like, okay, that's cool. But beyond that, I just, you know, I don't want to get into like, if you want to give me a museum pass, I'm going to see these museums anyway. Sure. I'll save some money and I'll, I'll yeah. make a little note, but I'm under no obligation to, to write about which museum because, I write about the ones I like anyway. So, right. um, you know, that's not to me like free travel. That's not what people think of like the perks of the job are. I, that was funny when I learned about the, like the welcome packet that cities will, will give. Like the first time I saw it in action was, um, I went to Chris Gillibo's like end of the world party in Norway. Yeah. And I was hanging out with Benny Lewis there who runs, you know, flew it in three months. A mutual friend of both of ours. You've known him longer than I have, but like we're both at our checked in the hotel, and he's got like this whole thing of all these museum passes he's got. And he's just like, yeah, I just emailed the tourism board and said I was coming to the city, and they're like, oh, a blogger, and they gave him like, you know, access to everything, and he only ended up using half of it because we weren't there for that long. But yeah, they're great. You should always get these uh, discount cards, like you know, like the Paris Museum Pass or the New York NYC Go Card. It'll save you a lot of money if you're doing lots of heavy sightseeing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so how does actually let's dive into the COVID side, right? Because COVID took a hit, huge hit on the entire travel, and we saw that just in the like running ConvertKit, where you know having bloggers in so many different areas, we had a lot of growth because lots of people were stuck at home and start like I'm going to start a new blog. I'm going to I have time to to work on this or whatever. And we saw a lot of cancellations, mostly from the travel industry of people like, look, now that what this 50,000 person list that was a huge asset is now just a giant liability because no one's planning trips. How did you navigate that time? And what, like, what's the journey been, you know, the last 18 months, two years? Well, first, I would say that's really short sighted of someone canceling their 50,000 person list. Like, I think they were like exporting, sitting on it and they're going to come back. But, but I agree. It was very short sighted. Yeah, like just like throwing away 50,000 emails, right? Um, I mean, it was tough in the beginning. You know, we went from like January and February were our like best months ever, you know, and like, I mean, even, and then all of a sudden, like, for, like March 13th, it's like that Friday, you know, it's like everything crashes. You know? Like, again, like we were on our way to have a banner year, like, 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 hand over fist money, I, you know, and, and then to being like, how am I going to pay the bills? You know? And so, cause you know, we have sort of the, the overhang from travel con, right. You know, like we didn't make money on the first two years and year three was the year, the break even year and, and travel con was in right in the world oh, wow. in March. Yeah. Right. And so I had laid out all like, you're so close to the event. That's you. That's when you start paying your bills. Right. Then the world hits and all the sponsors who, you know, have their money, you know, at, in the accounting department are like, oh, we're not paying this now. And so, 
you're like, well, I've just paid eighty thousand dollars in deposit, and all that money that was going to offset it is gone. And then you have people canceling. A lot of people were really mean about it. They're like, I want my money back now, and we're going to do chargebacks. So that you know, you have that overhang and just you know, fall in revenue. It's it was really tough. Thank God for government loans, to be quite honest. Like I, I wouldn't have made it through if it wasn't for all that because a lot of my my money was tied up in non-liquid assets. So it wasn't like I could just like sell some stocks to, you know, pay the bills. But things have come back a lot. I mean, there's a lot of pent up demand for travel. I view it like this way, right? You got kids, right? You know, they yep. get in trouble, you take away their toy and then you give them back, right? What do they want to do now? They just want to play with that toy even more because it's like, it's like, no, it's mine. No one else can have it. And like, would you want to do this other toy? No. And so now that, the, the toy of travel is being given back to people. Like people are like, never again am I going to miss out on this opportunity to, to travel on my dream trips. Let's make it happen. So we had a really good summer. I expect a mediocre fall and winter just as you know, kids are back in school, people are traveling less. You know, but as more in the world opens up, that will be good. But again, as I said at the beginning of this, it's going to take a while for us to get get back to where we were but there's definitely demand there when's the next conference when's travel con happening again uh, april 29th uh, okay 2022 so what's the how have ticket sales been for that is there like that pent up demand showing up and people booking conference tickets or are they kind of wait like wait and see you know you're not going to cancel this one too kind of thing yeah i mean we're definitely not canceling it i mean the world would have yeah. to really end for it uh, we just launched this week, so early October, we just announced our first round of speakers and we sold like 10 or 15 tickets. I, I don't expect a lot of people to buy until the new year. Yeah. And I saw this again in the old event, right? Because in the old event, we were had it in May 2019, right? And we announced in the fall, but it wasn't until like, you know, a few months prior that people started to buy their tickets, right? right. Because they don't know where they're going to be you know, where are they flying from? What, what are the COVID rules going to be like? The demand is there, but I, I know people are probably just waiting and see to, for their own schedule too, you know? So, but you know, we're going to sell 800 tickets. And honestly, from what I've heard from other events, you know, people are selling out, you know, because there is such demand, like it's not a problem of selling the tickets. So I'm not too worried. Yeah. One thing, this is like just a question that I'm curious for myself, since I also run a conference. What do you think about conferences that rotate cities or like, move, you know, move from city to city, which we've been to a lot of them that do it, you know, FinCon and podcast movement are two longer running ones that you and I have both been to. Obviously that's what you're doing with TravelCon. World Domination Summit, which we've both been to a lot, you know, is like very much, it's Portland. It's always Portland. It won't ever be anywhere, anywhere else. What do you think? Why did you choose? Why did you choose the approach that you did, and what do you think the pros and cons are? Yeah, for for me, it was, you know, we're in travel. I wanted to, you know, travel, right? And plus, you know, I mean, you get a, we get a host, right? So like, Memphis is our sponsor, right? It's in Memphis. You know, it was supposed to be in New Orleans. New Orleans was like our host sponsor, right? So moving it from city to city allows us to get, you know, a new. A host sponsor every year is going to pony up a bunch of money, right? I don't know how FinCon and podcast movement do it, but I think if I wasn't in travel and it, and it was more you know, something like traffic and conversion or maybe World Domination Summit, I would probably do it in the same place over and over again because you get better consistency. You know, one of the things I hate about events is that they move dates and move locations, right? And and so. It's a little hard to in travel because you know COVID really screwed us, right? But we're moving to being, you know, in the same time frame, right? We're always going to be in like early May. That's where we, I want to fall into, like early May travel con, change the city, but you get the same two week window because it's hard to plan, right? So like right. if you're changing dates and cities, you're you're just off every year. So I, I wanted some consistency to make it easier for people to know, like in their calendar, TravelCon early May, TravelCon early May. You know, yep. so it, it, it 
doesn't really work out because of COVID, you know, but post COVID we're, we're moving to that, to that early May. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk more about sort of scaling different between different levels of the business. So there's a lot of people who say are at 10, 20, 50,000 subscribers, somewhere in there. And it's very much the solar printer of like, this is, I'm a writer. I just do this myself, or maybe they, you know, contract out graphic design or a little bit more than that. What were some of the hardest things for you and like, and what worked and what didn't when you made the switch from it being nomadic Matt being just Matt to Matt plus a team? Yeah, it's definitely hard to give up that control, right? Because you always think no one can do your business better than you can. And I mean, even to this day, I still have issues doing it you know, giving up control, right? What's something that you don't want to, that you're like still holding on to that you know you need to let go of? Probably just little things like checking in on people and, you know, yeah. content. Probably like content. I'm very specific about my vo the voice we have. So, uh -huh. but I should just let my content people make the content that I know is fine. But I definitely probably overly check in on my team to be like, what you do today, you know? You know, that that kind of stuff. But I did take a vacation recently and I went offline for a week and they didn't burn the thing down. So I was like, you know, right. That was my way. Like, okay, I can, I can let go and it's going to be okay. But so getting comfortable with that much earlier on, I would probably save you a lot of stress and anxiety. But I, I definitely think you should move to at least having somebody, you know, a part-time VA. If, if you're making over six figures, hire somebody because you know how you're not going to go from 100k to 500k really by yourself um unless you know you just have some crazy funnel that you do but even people i know who are solopreneurs they still have like two or three people helping them a little bit right? you know part even if it's just part-time because the more money you make the more time you have to spend keeping that income up and so your goal as the creator and the owner should be, how can I grow? How can I make more money? It should not be setting up your WordPress blog. You know, it should not be answering d joke emails. It should not be, you know, scheduling your social media on Hootsuite. That kind of low level stuff can be done by, you know, a part-time VA, right? And maybe that part-time VA becomes a full-time VA as you scale up more, but, you know, if you, you have to free up your time, you know, and you're never going to free up your time if you're spending a lot of that time scheduling blog posts. So even if the people I know who have half a million dollar businesses selling courses, you know, and they're really just a solopreneur, they have somebody do that grunt work, right? Plus, if you're making that much money, is that the best use of your time? Not really, right? So... Getting somebody to do sort of the admin grunt work as soon as you can, uh, even if it's on a part-time basis, will allow you to focus on growth and marketing and monetization, which is where you should be. Like podcasts. This week, I have like four or five podcasts I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that is a good chunk of my week. And if I had to spend that time scheduling on social media, you know, or setting up blog posts, like I can couldn't do that. But this is where the growth in the audience comes in. Okay. So since we're talking about growth, what are the things that you can tie of like the effort that you put in that drives growth? Are there direct things or is it a very indirect, unattributable position? Yeah, I think there's some direct things. Like, you know, before, you know, asking 10 years ago, I would say guest posting on websites, right? Yeah. You write a guest post, you know, on like Tim Ferriss's site and boom, tons of traffic right? That doesn't exist anymore. I mean, yeah, you can get a lot of traffic, but it's not like the huge windfall it used to be, but it's still good sort of brand awareness, SEO, great for links, right? I would say things today that I can tie directly to uh, stuff, podcasts and Instagram. So doing okay. like a, doing like a joint Instagram live with another creator, right? You know, like, me and you know i don't know pat right because someone with a big following there we do a, we do a talk you know 30 minutes you know i can see in my analytics like a huge spike in following right after that and so that's a great way to sort of grow your audience is to do instagram collabs 
in just like 30 minute talks and podcasts. Yeah. I get a lot of people be like, I saw you on this podcast. I was like, wow, cool. I always struggle with that of like of all the activities that you can do because you get to a point where there's just so many opportunities open to you and it's like, which are the best use of time? What should you say yes to? What should you say no to? And I don't know, do you have a filter along those or do you just, is it just kind of gut feel? I will say yes to any text-based interview because normally it is the same questions over and over again. So I sort right. of have a lot of canned responses that I can just cut and paste and tweak, but those are linked. So I'm like, sure, yeah, yeah. Send your questions over, yeah. cut, paste, tweak, you know, you know, customize, customize a little bit. But you know, how many times do I need to rewrite from scratch? How did you get into blogging? You know, right. what's your favorite country? Podcasts, I'm, I definitely have a bigger filter on. Like you, I don't do new podcasts. I know that's mm -hmm. like bad because you know this new podcast could become the next big thing. But come back to me when you have some following i like seth godin's rule i'm not on seth godin's level by any means but he says like come back to me when you have 100 episodes i will happily be your 100th interview on your podcast or something like yeah that. and he's just like look put in your time and then we'll talk <laughs> yeah so i like i don't look for just following but like again you know knowing that people give up on, on blogs people give up on podcasts too so like you know you have to been doing it for like six months a year like week or weekly you know so i know like this is something you care about and i like to listen because you know you get a lot of new people and they're not really great you know they ask us like a lot of canned questions and you're like listen you're taking you know an hour hour and a half of my time you gotta make it inter interesting for me well yeah podcast and then for instagram stories you gotta have or instagram live either a brand new audience or if you're in travel at least seventy five thousand. Because I have like a 130, so I want to keep it in the same kind of level. Yeah, I know nothing about Instagram and promotions on Instagram and, and all of that. Is there, if, if someone were to, like in my case, if I come to you and say, hey, I want to grow my Instagram following, I've got 3,000 people or 5,000 people or something like that. And I want to be, have 50,000 a year from now. Where would you point me? I would say, do joint Instagram lives with people like okay. once a week, you know, and just, or, or maybe once a week, or, week or for you and then go to somebody else on their side once a week. So, and just kind of work your way up, like find people in your, your sort of follower account level, you know? So in this case, I'd probably do, you know, you know, 1000 to 5,000 I would yep. go for in your niche and like get online for 30 minutes and talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. And then go to someone else's channel and do that. And then keep doing that because you'll, you'll see giant spikes. And then you can move up the, the ladder, right? You know, suddenly you have 10,000 followers. And, you know, somebody with 25,000 followers might give you the time of day. And then you talk about that, you know, and you just sort of build awareness because you're always there. You're always around. That's a really good point about figuring out what those rough bands are and reaching out within those. Cause I think a lot yeah. of people are like, I'm going to go pitch whoever on doing Instagram live together. And it's like, you have 5,000 and they have 150,000 and like the content might be a perfect fit, but they're most likely going to say no, because you're not, yeah. you're not driving that much value for or that my many subscribers for their audience. Yeah. You know? And so maybe I would, you know, if someone was like a finance blogger and they had like, 40,000, you know, maybe 30, 40,000, I probably would do it because people who like to save money like to save money on travel. So be, like right. there's probably a good fit and you know, 30,000 people, they might not know me, but if they're like, like you said, 3,000, come back to me, you know, when there's another zero. Right. Well, and then the other thing that's going to be true is if I'm bringing you to, to my audience to share and teach something, if you're using this strategy, like go do another 20 of these or 50 of these and your pitch will be better. And the way that you, you know, teach finance to travel bloggers or whatever else it is, is going to get so much better. And so yeah. at that point, it's like, I kind of don't want to be your guinea pig. <laughs> you know, I don't want my audience to be your guinea, the, yeah. you know, guinea pig for your content. And so just get more experience and come back. Yeah. And, you know, you also got to think about, you know, people are so time starved, right? You know, when I started blogging and I could write a guest post, there was no Instagram, 
There was no Snapchat. There was no TikTok. You know, Twitter was barely a thing. So I didn't have to split my focus on so many different platforms and channels, right? I could just, all right, I could be on in this one blog. But now when people are like, well, sorry, I have to like manage all these different social channels um, and all these comments and, and the blog and everything, they not don't have like an hour to give, you know, to just anybody the way you could have before. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Okay, so on the email side specifically, if someone came to you with, say, a thousand newsletter subscribers today, and they're like, "I want to grow," I mean, you're looking to grow to five thousand. This might be so far removed from where you're at that you're like, "I don't even know." If that was, you know, a decade ago that I was in that position. But what are you seeing that's working, and where would you point them? What works for us right now? One, having email forms everywhere on your site, sidebar, footer. We have them below the content, below the content forms in pop-ups, pop-ups still work. They, yeah. They're really great. We find for really long posts, having a form in the middle of the post converts better than at the end of the post. Because okay. I mean, a lot of people don't read to the end, but when they get to the middle, you're still there. You know, if you look at heat maps, a really long website, right? You just see that drop off, right? So if all your forms are at the bottom of the page, they're just not getting the visibility that you need. So middle of the page works really well. Do you play with a lot of different incentives of like, you know, opt in for this free guide, you know, or are you customizing it to something for a particular country or their, the content that they're reading or any of that? Yeah. So we use OptiMonster for that. And so we have like, if you go, if you go to our pages that are tagged Europe, you get a whole different set of opt-ins than if you go to Australia, like, and, and like the incentives are like, you know, best hostels in Europe, you know, best hostels in Australia, right? Like little checklist guides. And I, I tweak with the copy for that, you know, just to see what wording will lift up a better conversion rate. But yeah, we yeah. definitely, because, you know, we cover so many geographic areas, the needs of someone going to Europe are a little different than somebody going to New Zealand. So we, we definitely customize the, that kind of messaging. And I think that helps a lot, you know, and, and definitely customizing messaging as, as much as possible, you know, but in terms of just, you know, we can talk about, you know, the market, the, like, how do you word things, but middle pop-ups and middle of blog posts definitely converts the best. And so like, that's where we see a lot of growth as well as just on Instagram, telling people to sign up for my newsletter or Twitter or, or Facebook, like, don't let the algorithm, you know, keep you from your travel tips. Sign up now. And people do. Okay. And is that like swipe up on stories that you're doing or, yeah. on, you know, on an Instagram live or all of the above? All of the above. Yeah. And you're just constantly reminding people to sign up for the list, you know, and I think one of the failings of so many quote unquote influencers today is, you know, they always regret everyone as they everyone does they always regret not starting the list sooner you know and so you know you just got to hammer into people sign up for the list sign up for the list sign up for the list you know and a lot of the copy is do you see all my updates no would you like to sign up for this newsletter yeah because everyone knows i mean i come across people all the time it's like i used to follow them on instagram i haven't seen Oh, no, I do still follow them on Instagram. Instagram just decided that I apparently didn't engage with their content enough or, or something. And, yeah. And so now I no longer see their posts. <laughs> yeah. you like, I, go, I always go to my like 50 least interacted profiles, right? And yeah, there are some people that aren't there, but I'm like, I interact with this guy all the time. How is this the least interactive? But that, that's Instagram saying, here are the people we don't show you in your feed. Wait, where do you see that? Is that... If you go to your, who you're following, it's, okay. it should be up on the top. Hmm. All right, I'll have to look at that. Uh, yeah, I'll send you a screenshot. And so like, that's the algorithm. Be like, here are the people you interact with the least. But it's like, no, I, I love their stuff. Why, right. wh why do you take them from me? So, and Zuckerberg is like, do you really love their stuff? I just, I'm not feeling it. So yeah. we're going to just hide that right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, it's just, you know, the algorithms are terrible. And what I hate, and I learned this last year, and this was sort of a 
unsurprising but surprising thing is that story, which used to be like the latest first, Revel was yeah. like, that is they have an algorithm for that now too. And I was like, I I shouldn't be surprised, but I am surprised and I'm annoyed by that because like I liked it when it was just the newest first. But nope. Now that is based on, you know, sort of like the TikTok thing of like, oh, this story is getting really uh, a lot of interactions, we'll bring it up the front uh, okay. people's queue. Or, you know, so it's not just like you're first because you had one one second ago. You know, like mm -hmm. it, it could, it's based on an algorithm. Yeah, and that's how it, it's all going to go. Facebook did that a lot, you know, with Facebook fan pages back in the day where it used to be fantastic for engagement. And then they were like, yeah, it's fantastic if you pay us. Yeah. And even then, it's like I would pay to boost posts. I was like, "Great, you saw an extra five people. What? I just gave you a hundred bucks. That was no way." <laughs> and, and there was some guy. I remember him commenting last year. He's like, "Whatever happened to this page?" I was like, "I'm still here." He's like, "No, no, no, no." And this is in the comment thread in Facebook. He's yeah. like, this, "Your page used to get a lot more engagement. What happened?" I was like, "Oh, Facebook al algorithm." And I was like, "People just don't see it." Let me tell you on the. Or on my analytics side, it's like this page so I have two thousand people. You're like, great, one percent. Woo! Uh, do you do paid advertising of like to get email subscribers? We used to, but the CPMs went up so much that it wasn't worth the effort. You know, like paying a dollar fifty two bucks for an email subscriber is just a lot of money for for yeah for things we don't monetize directly. Like we're not sticking people through funnels to buy a course, right? Like just to get raw email, I'm not paying two bucks per, per person, you know? Yeah. And, and so I just, we stopped paying like during the pandemic, like J June of last year, we were like, oh, we're gonna take a break. And then we hit, paid somebody to help us for it and they kind of reset it up. But I just had to spend down so much. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna turn it off for a bit. And yeah, that's been like- Didn't really miss it. Yeah, I looked at the numbers recently because I was thinking, should we do it? And it's not that big of a difference of just doing it organically on like Instagram stories or just right. on the page, right? And I also don't really like giving money to the Zuckerberg empire of, you know, I'm just not a fan of yeah. that business. And so like, I know my ad spend is low, but I can't say just on a raw number, like it wasn't that big of a deal. like. You know, like, because the CPMs were so high, we were having to pay a lot of money. So, like, you, we put in, like, two grand, you know, a month, and we, you know, we weren't getting thousands. We were getting hundreds of people. You know, I right. want, for, for two grand, I want thousands of people. Yeah. For my local newsletter, we're doing paid advertising on Facebook and Instagram and averaging about $2 per subscriber. And that, I think now that's considered pretty good. Like, a lot of with a broader audience, you'd be at three dollars or more per subscriber, and it, it gets expensive pretty fast. Yeah, I, I mean, but I think at, at some point you'll just see such diminishing returns that, right? You know, I mean, how many people are in Boise can you hit, you know, over and over again, right? Yep. I, I was just reading Seth Gordon's book, uh, This Is Marketing, and he said, you know, he, he, they talk about ads, and he's like, you turn off ads when the accountant says turn them off, and my accountant. I mean, it was like, no, they're not really paying for themselves. Yeah. So, yeah, you turn that off. Um, looking forward, maybe like two or three years, because I think your business is fascinating of the approach that you have of taking an online audience, building a real team around it, and then building it into the in person community. What do you think the business is going to look like in two, three years? Where, where is revenue coming from? What's your vision for the events and meetups? And what are the things that, like, over that time period that get you really excited? You know, two, three years, so we're talking, you know, 20, by 2023, most of our revenue are coming from stuff in person. Doing, you know, having chapters around the world, people pay to go to them. So, you know, it, but it's like 10 bucks and you can bring a friend for free, right? So it's like five bucks a person, right? Just for the cost of like hosting events, right? Doing lots of that, doing tours, we're bringing back and they won't be just with me because they're community events, right? So we'll have guides, right? So it's not just you're coming to travel with me, sort of what Rick Steve does, right? You go on a Rick Steve's tour, it's his itinerary, right. but he's not on the tour, right? He shows up to a couple of them throughout the season. 
And it's not like you don't expect him to be your guy every time. So moving right. to that, having a consumer event for like like a like a world domination summit, you know, a weekend somewhere just for travel consumers, having an app. We're about to have an app for that company. Uh, then online, just being a lot of ads and affiliates, and you know, even maybe just even taking away just having this like passive income course, just because you know, one less thing to worry about, right? Hmm. And then TravelCon still being around, but actually making money this time. Do you think TravelCon is going to turn into? I mean, obviously, it's a significant amount of revenue, but the expenses are so high. Do you think it'll turn into a, a profitable business? Oh, yeah, yeah, like. I mean, a lot of the unprofitability just comes from the fact that I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, I, I know that firsthand from my own conference. <laughs> so, yeah. It was, I, I didn't realize how quickly expenses could stack, right? You know, being like, oh, okay, like my food and beverage budget is 120000 writing that in there, and then getting a $145,000 bill because, oh, yeah, it's 120000 in food, but then there's tax fees, gratuity, you know, all this stuff. And you're like, Oh, okay. Well, that's twenty five thousand dollars off the profit, right? And so, with a better handle of expenses, like we we're definitely like this year, we were gonna like break even, you know, at the very minimum. Well, pre COVID, and this year we'll also break break even. And so, just keeping a handle on, you know, like how about I don't invite a hundred speakers, you know, and, and and be like, oh, I had planned to only budget, you know, fifty thousand speaker fees, but. Now I'm at 80. Okay, like handling the cost better, we're, we're good. Now I have a, a professional events team that kind of slaps me around. It's like, can't spend that money. I know how that is where I'm like, hey, what if? And they're just like, no. Yeah. I love it, but no, because yeah. you don't <laughs> like you don't have the budget for it. Yeah, but what if, no. I mean, you know, we used to have a party every night and we're getting rid of the second night party because people don't want to go. Like we didn't have a lot of people show up is like they're out and about on town so it's like right. wow i just spent you know forty thousand dollars for like a third of the conference to come you know yeah why not take that money and use it to something that's more valuable for everybody that has more like impact per dollar spent and still not like go over budget you know same thing with lunches we got we're getting rid of we're doing one lunch now you know because you know, people don't really care that much, you know, about including yeah, lunch. It's super interesting. Well, I love the the vision of where the conference is going and and particularly just the way that the whole community interplays. And I think it's been fun watching you figure out what you want your business model to be. Because obviously with a large audience, your business model can be any one of a hundred different variations. And I like that you keep iterating on it and figuring out the yeah. community focus one. We're definitely going in person. We're definitely going to expand to colleges. So taking okay. the meetup and, and doing like a presentation to like a local like student union, because uh, got to keep people, you know, in the grinder, right? Like got to keep feeding the grinder, right? So That's college right. students love saving money. We we are experts at that. So they love to travel. So just giving like a presentation to like college campuses around the world as a way to expose them to our brand and get them to our like local event. Like, hey, college student in Boston, do you like this event? Well, we have a local chapter here. Come join us. Right. You know, yeah. and then they sign up for that and they get money from now. I like it. Well, if anyone wants to sign up and follow along and all of that, where should they go to see the Instagrams and subscribe to the newsletter and everything else? Yeah, you can find me at nomadicmat.com. The community website is thenomadicnetwork.com. And at Nomadic Matt on every social media platform. That's the good thing about finding something somewhat unique and doing it nice and early. Is yeah. that you can just claim it rather than yeah. being the whatever underscore something. And yeah, yeah. This, I mean, it also helps having an established brand and a trademark because if someone like someone took my name on TikTok and I was just like, nope, TikTok, and like, okay, it's now yours. There you go. Yep, it's a good way to go. Well, Matt, thanks for hanging out today, and I'll catch you later. Yeah, thanks for having me. See ya.